Hello, everyone. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day, everyone. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day and welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by American Jewish Committee. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. As the war grinds on in Ukraine and as Israel battles Iran-backed terrorists on multiple fronts, America prepares to inaugurate Donald Trump to a second term as president. And joining us today for a post-election analysis and discuss what the outcome of the 2024 election means for the United States, the Jewish community in the world, is Elliot Abrams, who is the U.S. Special Representative for Iran and Venezuela from 2019 to 2021, and the Deputy National Security Advisor from 2005 to 2009. Moderating today's conversation is AJC Chief Policy and Political Affairs Officer Jason Isaacson. After we hear from Jason and Elliot, we will take your questions. You may email your questions to questions at ajc.org, that's questions plural, or you can use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Jason, the floor is yours. Daniel, thank you very much. Um, good to see you again, Elliot. Thank we, we've had, thank you. We've, we've had two weeks now to think through the results and the impact of this election, especially the policy implications of a second Trump administration, but also the meaning of unitary Republican control of Congress as well. And we've been guided not only by statements of the president-elect in the course of the campaign and since, and not only by recollections of the first Trump administration, but also by the announcements of intended appointments of key administration officials we've seen in the last several days. And I'd like to start with that last set of data points in my conversation with Elliot Abrams, a longtime friend of HAC, veteran of multiple Republican administrations, and one of Washington's most knowledgeable foreign policy practitioners. So Elliot, there's been a good deal of commentary in the last week or so that the individuals put forward for key foreign policy posts, Senator Rubio as Secretary of State, Congressman Waltz as National Security Advisor, Congresswoman Stefanik as UN Ambassador, and Governor Huckabee as Ambassador to Israel. They're all regarded as experienced mainstream figures. While a significant number of announced appointees to other posts are in a different category entirely. Uh, Congressman Gates as Attorney General being among the biggest lightning rods, as you know. Is there a pattern here, a sense that foreign policy demands more experienced hands than, say, the Justice Department or Health and Human Services? What's your, think what's your thinking? Excuse me. First, uh, thanks for inviting me. Very glad to do this. I wouldn't look for a pattern uh, much like that. I think, you know, President Trump doesn't go for patterns very much. Um, and uh, this may be the luck of the draw. I think um, he th these are more mainstream people. There's no question about that. And they're all very pro-Israel. No question about that either. Some of the outliers, I mean, Gates, for example, uh, I, I would think has approaching zero chance of being confirmed. Um, so you have to ask, you know, well, is that a throwaway by um, Trump or or is, is he trying to shelter others by giving uh, <laughs> some red meat for, to people to uh, vote no? <clears throat> but um, I do think that from the Israeli point of view, this is a very good pro-Israel team and it's people they know um, and who the American Jewish community knows, though obviously some better than others, will be, will be a lot better than, you know, um, let's say, um, exit. But um, uh, it's, it's quite a pro-Israel team. I think if you were looking at this from a Palestinian point of view or Egyptian, Jordanian point of view, that would be your main takeaway. I mean, I think I'm speaking to you from the Gulf, um, and I will tell you that so far in discussions that I've been having with an AJC delegation, there is a very positive impression given, first of all, by President Trump himself, uh, but also by the people who he has put forward as part of his foreign policy team. So um, obviously there are more appointments to come. 
but uh, but in terms of Marco Rubio and uh, and Congressman Waltz, um, you know, certainly very positive impressions that that, that that we've been hearing so far so so far this week. Um, but but talk about your own experiences um, with your own observations uh, of members of this new foreign policy team. You've had some experience, obviously, with uh, Senator Rubio, certainly. Yeah, um, I was a Rubio supporter in 2016, actually, uh, when he ran for president. Um, <clears throat> He's very much in the Republican mainstream <clears throat> um, and really is a senator from Florida. So in addition to being concerned about Latin America, which I think is a very good thing because many secretaries of state are not. Um, he knows that Jewish community very well. <clears throat> he's um, and he's got a long record um, on Israel and the Middle East. So this is not peripheral to him. It's been a central concern of his for a long time. Um, Mike Huckabee, um, you know, if the Jewish community is going to have any concerns, it would be, wait a minute, he's too pro-Israel. Um, he's, you know, he approaches this from a religious dash evangelical point of view and has taken positions that are uh, on things like the two-state solution um, that are actually tougher then I'd say, would say the American Jewish mainstream, though I actually share some of those positions, but um, very, very um, strong supporter of Israel, again, for decades. This is not something new to him. Then you have at least Stefanik at the UN. My own view is that when you have a career foreign service officer at the UN, and we have numerous times, um, they don't fight quite the way political appointees fight. I think Stefanik is in the tradition of, let's say, Moynihan, Kirkpatrick, Bolton, um, being willing to fight the UN, not looking for diplomatic ways of dampening this and compromising that, um, happy to cast vetoes of anything um, that's attacking Israel. Um, and the reputation is very important too. That is the idea that you'll do that is important in the negotiating process because if you get a bad draft and you want to fix it, the notion that the ambassador is just happy to veto it if it isn't fixed, not reluctant to do so, um, is a very good negotiating tool. So <clears throat> I think we'll, we will see her, you know, in the bully pulpit, but also having an impact on the UN system. Yeah, you know, I should I should have pointed out in introducing you, uh, Daniel and, and myself, we, we talked about just a couple of the positions that you've held in previous administrations. I must also note, you were Assistant Secretary for Inter-American Affairs in a previous administration at the State Department. So the idea that there'll be a Secretary of State who has a particular focus on Latin America, I think must have special resonance with you. You're a former Assistant Secretary for International Organization Affairs, a former yeah. Assistant Secretary for Human yeah, Rights, if I remember type. correctly. Um, so uh, there's a lot that, that you bring to this conversation. Let, let, me, let me ask you about the necessity, and this wasn't part of our original script Elliot, but I really do need to ask. Um, AJC has our own Latin America program, uh, the Bila Institute, uh, focusing on Latin American affairs. We've had delegations regularly uh, to Latin America. Is that? Do you see that emerging as a new focus by the Trump administration in ways that the American government has not of not necessarily given it the priority that it deserves? I hope so. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm I'm dubious only because. You know, I've watched uh, secretaries of state and, and they all have the same problem, which is time um, and crises. And if you're coming in now and you've got a war in Gaza and in Lebanon and in Ukraine and you worry about China, Taiwan, you're worried about Russia's threats to Ukraine, you know, um, Latin America tends not to be at the top of your list. There is an exception now because of migration. Well, actually, for two reasons, I'd say. One is migration, which is obviously a huge political issue. The other is Mexico. And that's not just a migration issue. I would argue that we're seeing a real downturn in democracy in Mexico. 
uh, as a result of what AMLO, the outgoing or the recently outgoing president, has done <clears throat> with the National Electoral Commission, with, with, with diminishing the courts, um, I think it's a real problem. And the question of law and order uh, versus the cartels in Mexico, again, they're in worse shape than they were five or 10 years ago. Um, so that's, that, you know, that's our neighbor. Uh, and it, it affects our economy. It affects drugs coming across the border. Um, and of, of course, it'll affect the, the migration issue. So I think that's going to end up getting more time. Add to it that, you know, Rubio is a little more concerned with these things, say, than most of his predecessors. I think Mexico is going to get more time. The rest of Latin America, uh, beyond the migration issue, you know, he may want to give it more time. And the question is whether you're going to, that really is going to be possible. And that will turn in part on the crises in the Middle East get worse or get better. Okay, so let's go back to the Middle East. Thank you for that. Um, in the first days after the election, of course, it was notable that the president-elect announced that he would appoint a special envoy to the Middle East, the real estate developer, investor, and philanthropist, and Trump golfing buddy, um, Stephen yes. Whitcoff. Um, is, it, is it significant that this was among the first of his appointments? And does Whitcoff's professional background give any indication of how the second Trump administration intends to approach Middle East peacemaking? You know, uh, it is significant, and I, and I, I would come at it at a slightly different angle. We have relations with 193 countries, probably, um, including Canada and Mexico, our neighbors, including old allies like England, France, really important countries like China and Russia. What gets announced? The ambassador to Israel. It's really beyond belief. It is beyond yeah, UN belief. Israel. Yeah. 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 Um and then and then the the um special envoy. I think it shows a few things. One, like the announcement of Huckabee, um, this is really a high priority relationship for the administration and for the president personally. Um, secondly, I think, as you suggested, um, it shows that he wants to see what can be negotiated, presumably starting with the old Abraham Accords. Uh, but you've got another negotiation, maybe completed by then. We've got another couple of months, Lebanon. And it does show uh, President Trump's view that traditional diplomats are not really good at negotiating. And that if you want a negotiator, you know, we used to joke about this, but the joke was you got two choices, a New York real estate man or a divorce lawyer. And uh, he goes for real estate men. Um, and, and I think I would say quite seriously, there is something to that. That is many people who rise in the foreign service to be excellent diplomats in many ways, are not really good, tough negotiators because they haven't done enough of it. Um, and I, it, it, it's pretty obvious, I think, looking at uh, Trump over the last decade, that he thinks negotiating is an art. He wrote a book about it. And he thinks that people in the private sector do it best. Thus, he chooses another one. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what role Jared Kushner plays um, as well. But... It's a useful thing to have, I think, because <clears throat> your Secretary of State cannot spend his whole life traveling between, you know, Abu Dhabi um, and, and Riyadh and Jerusalem and Cairo. There just isn't enough time. So who's going to do that? Ideally, and this was true of Jared Kushner and it is true of Whitcoff. Ideally, it is someone who actually knows the president, who can actually pick up the phone without, you know, three days of emailing to set up a, no, just pick up the phone and say, hey, look, I'm here in wherever. And I just talked, let's say, Jerusalem, and I just talked to Bibi and listen, that's a huge advantage because doing it through the normal diplomatic route is really slow. So... 
I get the the the, the real estate negotiation angle. Uh, that makes sense. Um, will that be the core of the solution to the Palestinian? Israeli conflict. To what extent do you expect the second Trump administration to focus on the Palestinian Israeli conflict? <clears throat> to, yeah. to what degree, to what degree is there any possible horizon in any feasible near or medium term for a resolution of that conflict? And can that be broken away as it frankly sort of, sort of was in the first Trump administration? Was the larger Arab Israeli issues? It was pretty much broken away. Although the role of the Emirates did turn in part on uh, the government of Israel agreeing not to take uh, land in the in the West Bank, um, I I think you could break off to some degree Lebanon, and I'm fairly optimistic actually about a, a Lebanon deal now under that is in the Biden administration because. Um, Israel's rather fantastic military achievements, I think, have led Iran and Hezbollah to want a ceasefire of some kind and the hell with Gaza. Um, to go back to the Abraham Accords now, which presumably uh, Mr. Whitcoff will try to do, you're going to run into the Saudi statements about a Palestinian state. And Pardon me, there's a huge difference between the old Saudi position and the current one. I, I think it's really remarkable. In the course of this year, prior to October 7th of last year, the Saudi position was somewhat amorphous about what they would accept on the Palestinian state issue. And it got harder and harder and harder. And you've had the foreign minister and you've had MBS make fairly categorical statements about Palestinian statehood. And the question there, I think, is going to be uh, for Whitcoff to find out or for the president and Rubio to find out what's the wiggle room. Then you're going to have to go talk to the government of Israel and find out what's their wiggle room. To put it, you know, in Venn diagram terms, is there any place where what the Saudis need and what the Israelis can offer overlap? Um, it may be very small and it may be non-existent because there is no taste, as I see it in Israel, for any real talk about Palestinian statehood. Um, there's a second problem that, that I think will arise. It, it's really the same issue. And it's one we've been dealing with for a year. Tell me what the government of Gaza is going to be. Tell me who enforces a ceasefire in Gaza the day after. Um, the government of Israel has been unwilling to put forward a plan. Uh, the government of the United States has been unwilling to put forward a plan, um, uh, for which I'm actually quite critical. I think the United States should by now have done that. But uh, I don't think it's going to be possible to separate these things out. If you want to get the Saudis closer to Israel, you're going to have to talk about the Palestinian issue. I mean, do you imagine that there might be some appetite to bring back the peace to prosperity proposals, just dust them off the shelf that came out in the, was it the last year or so of the Trump administration, last yeah. year and a half of the Trump administration, which well, I'm would, sure. have produced a really shrunken Palestinian state, but something that could ultimately yeah. be a state? I, I think <clears throat> it will be brought out of the closet. And the first thing is for everybody to remember what was in it. Um, and you're right. I mean, it had the word state. It did have a million um, <clears throat> additional conditions about, well, what kind of state and when. And um, okay. But um, I think that's going to be actually a disruptive factor in Israeli politics uh, to start talking about Palestinian statehood. Um, and so I'm I'm uh, optimistic about Lebanon. I'm not optimistic about what happens in Gaza. Well, by the way, on Lebanon, um, I think you're optimistic that there could be a ceasefire. Are you optimistic that there could actually be with Hezbollah decapitated and significantly weakened, although still there and still firing missiles at Israel yeah. on a pretty regular basis, some really to lethal effect? It's horrendous. Um, do you see the possibility of Lebanon itself 
stabilizing and actually having an elected president and a government that's responsible and even could possibly yeah. someday down the road enter into negotiations with Israel? Well, I think the deal, whatever, if a deal is struck, the general terms of the deal are going to be that there will be a, a Lebanese president chosen and that Hezbollah forces will stay essentially north of the Litani. Um, who's going to enforce that? I think it's very clear that Unifil is not going to enforce it and the Lebanese army is not going to enforce it. Not really. I mean, they may occasionally push back a little bit and say to people from Hezbollah, you know, you shouldn't really go there, but it's going to be Israel. And I think the key Israeli demand in that deal is, of course, going to be that we have the right to enforce this. <clears throat> Hezbollah will start cheating immediately because they're going to want to find out what they can get away with. This is, uh, in a sense, a recapitulation of what happened when Israel got out of Gaza. Uh, the Prime Minister Sharon said, if there is one rocket coming out of Gaza, we'll just slam them. But he didn't do it. And Hezbollah, learned, excuse me, Hamas learned the lesson. Okay, now we can start probing. Can we, one rocket? What, what about three rockets? What about 30 rockets? And that started while Sharon was still alive and was, was uh, I should say, before his January or February uh, stroke when he was prime minister. <clears throat> That's what's got to be avoided here. If there is a deal and Hezbollah violates it, the Israelis should just slam them immediately and make it clear to them and to the U.S. and everybody else, we're going to enforce this deal quite seriously. And I think um, the, the, the enforcement of the deal is 100% going to be dependent on Israeli willpower. But I think in that context, the deal can last years uh, because Hezbollah is very badly hurt. And it will take it time to rebuild. It will take time also to rebuild some of those <clears throat> Shia communities um, that have been uh, blasted by Israel because they're filled with Hezbollah fighters. And the other thing Israel is going to have to do, and it's, it's going to be a constant battle, is to try to prevent the rebuilding of Hezbollah, to prevent arms from coming in from the sea um, or from Syria, for that matter, from Turkey. Um, that, I think, is going to be a multi-year effort. And here, this is a test of the Trump administration, because our attitude in the U.S. should be, <clears throat> if a deal is made, it needs to be enforced, do it. Do what you need to do. And we're going to need to tell the Arabs, tell the Europeans, tell the U.N. Uh, this deal has to be enforced. It's for the benefit of all Lebanese. That, that a peace deal remains intact. And that's going to be a constant fight, diplomatically. What, what, what will be the role of the Lebanese armed forces? Do you see the Lebanese armed forces actually having the power, the capability, um, the will to play the kind of role that one would expect an army in a neighboring country to play against terrorists? I'm very dubious because they never have. I mean, what, what are we talking about? <clears throat> um, a Hezbollah group wants to patrol a road. They want to be on a road they shouldn't be on. Do you actually block them and, and threaten them? If you continue down this road, we will shoot you. Will the Lebanese army do that? I think it's highly, highly unlikely, any more than UNIFIL has done that. You know, once in a blue moon, again, they will they'll push back without shooting. They'll say, you can't do this. And you're going to create an incident. <clears throat> and we're going to call, you know, we're going to make this public. Um, and once in a while, Hezbollah has thought better of it. But they're not going to shoot. That's the problem. The Lebanese army is willing to police up, frankly, Palestinians. And it is conceivable to me <clears throat> that they would protect the border a bit, border with Syria. But they're not going to shoot Shia Lebanese. Uh, and their unwillingness to do that is, I think, the limiting factor here. That's what Israel is going to have to do. But but with forces not on Lebanese territory? Right. I think it's clear that the Israelis do not want any residual forces there. 
That's a separate situation from Gaza. Um, <clears throat> it is a foreign country. Um, and I think they will be doing this from the air. I don't rule out an occasional incursion, but I think that'd be very rare. They don't want, uh, if a deal is made, I think they will not be enforcing it by a presence on the ground. Let me go back to Gaza before I turn to other subjects. Um, it's more than 400 days now that there have been hostages in Gaza. Um, what, how do you see what is the best possible scenario that you can envision of how this plays out, how we get the hostages home and the remains of those who were killed in, in Gaza? Uh, you know, the best possible thing would be a negotiation where Hamas releases them. Um, there's no evidence that Hamas is willing to do that. Um, and I think the Israelis have come to that conclusion, though they haven't said so publicly, that I think they've come to the conclusion that they just need to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And maybe they will discover some hostage here or there. Maybe one group in Hamas or one group of criminals will be willing to um, release some hostages, maybe in exchange for money. That requires a continuing uh, reduction of, Hamas's, of Hamas's power and influence in Gaza. If you want people to defy Hamas and say, let's take the money and release some hostages, um, you need Hamas to be even more defeated than it is now. So I think what you're seeing the Israelis prepare for is, first of all, to keep that pressure on um, on a permanent basis. And you see them doing some things that suggest that they're going to have a military presence there, not just going in and out, but some kind of military presence, certainly on the Egyptian border, the Philadelphia Strip, and at other places inside Gaza, unless and until somebody has a better solution. And again, nobody is proposing such a solution. So factor in an incoming administration in two months. Um, what is what does President Trump want to happen before he steps back into the Oval Office? Does he want to have this war on both fronts over? Does he want to have a, an expanded U.S. role, a minimal U.S. role? How do you see the new administration, the fact that the new administration is coming in, play into the equation here? I think he'd very much like to see that deal done in Lebanon. Stop the fighting there. <clears throat> isolate this to now a Gaza issue. Um, and I'm sure, you know, there is that famous quote, maybe even accurate quote to uh, from Trump to Netanyahu, do what you have to do, get her over with. <clears throat> I'm sure the president-elect would like that to happen. It's not going to happen, in my opinion. Um, Gaza, January 20th, I think looks a lot like Gaza today. And so the new administration is going to have to figure out, well, all right, then what do we want? And I think what they will want is um, a reduction in the amount of fighting, a reduction in the um, number of people being killed um, in Gaza, Israeli and Palestinian. They uh, lower this on the international uh, menu of events. You can reduce the attention. If that happens, then you can begin to talk more realistically, perhaps, with the Saudis about how do we continue this trend of diminishing the amount of fighting. And you can argue to the Saudis, look, if you're going to hold out for perfection, you're not helping. You're not helping us. You're not helping Palestinians. You should make that argument. So uh, I think personally that that is the best you can hope for um, in Gaza in two months. Do you see a Trump administration playing a role in the reconstruction of Gaza? Not really. Um, you know, President Trump's not real big on foreign aid. The notion that um, he would say, you know, well, it's going to take $100 billion, we'll do half, th that's not going to happen. Um, especially because, you know, what is the argument about Ukraine? It's in Europe. Why aren't the Europeans doing more? These are rich countries. A fortiori when it comes to Gaza, 
um, where you've got some very large potential donors, start with uh, the Qataris, Emiratis, Saudis. I'm sure he would want them to um, be the main donors. The United States will never be in a position of saying, no, we won't do anything. But um, I have no doubt that he believes we should not be the main donor. That's going to be true, I would say, of UNRWA in the future, too. Um, the, you know, we've carried UNRWA, we the United States, for decades now. There's really no reason for that. Um, let me get into the kind of the mechanics of the new administration uh, with a special envoy. Um, is it at all clear how a Middle East envoy can be expected to interact with the relevant components of the State Department, the National Security Council? Under President Obama, there was a Middle East special envoy's office in the State Department. Right. Under President Trump, point one point oh, um, it was Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt and yeah. the group that was working out of the White House. Yeah. Do you see it happening more like that this time? And does it matter in, in how policy is implemented? Yeah, it matters. Um, I mean, if you're Marco Rubio, it certainly matters to you. You don't want a situation where you're Secretary of State and have no influence on a major international issue, such as Middle East peace. Um, so I think the most you can hope for is that there is a unified team and that it includes the National Security Advisor, the Envoy, U.S. Secretary of State, and let's say, presumably, your Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs. Um, it doesn't always work that way. Um, sometimes it's all White House and the State Department is out of it. Uh, if I were Rubio, I would be trying to get guarantees right now that that won't happen. Um, personalities matter. Who you know? Who is going to be the Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East? Um, we've really seen currently in the Biden administration, the Assistant Secretary, I'm being candid here, Barbara Leaf has not been a powerful figure. Um, and uh, so you have people like Brett McGurk and Amos Hochstein really carrying the load. Um, that, uh, again, if you're Marco Rubio, you don't want that to happen. You want you're never going to be able to take this away from the White House. Um, but what you can hope for is a kind of integrated team that really represents the administration and where you, your guy is on the inside. Although you have to say that under President Biden, you've had a secretary of state who has been again and again and again and again in the Middle East as a not only secretary of state, but a former senior aide to President Biden when he was in the U.S. Senate. So they've got a very different kind of relationship than I think President Trump has with Senator Rubio and perhaps any other. It's true. And I'm not so sure that's the best model. That is, the secretary, again, you know, you've got Ukraine, you've got Taiwan, you've got right. yeah. many things on your plate. Um, you're not the Middle East envoy. You're the secretary of state. You've got to cover every problem on the globe. Uh, I think I can make a pretty good argument that while the amount of time um, that the secretary has, Sony Blinken has spent on this is in a kind of moral sense admirable. Um, it may not be the best way to use a secretary of state's time when you've got, um, let's say, Brett McGurk, uh, almost Oxine, who seem to be very capable people. You, you, don't, you know, we can draw up an org chart now uh, and we can fill in the names for who is the head who is the senior director for Near East or North Africa in the National Security Council? Who is the assistant secretary of state? The York chart, you know, will give way within a few months. People may um, not respect each other. People may not like each other. Um, you never quite know how it's how, how it's going to work. We're not going to know until a few months into the administration. This is this is the words of someone who has worked in the White House and the State Department. Well, yeah. And, you know, the general view of people in the State Department is we're the professionals and we need to keep these amateurs in the White House out of it. And in the White House, it's exactly the opposite. It's, you know, <laughs> we represent the president. Who are these fancy pants diplomats? So you've got to work that out. And there's a different balance in each administration. Elliot, uh, let me turn to the subject of Iran. Um, you handled the Iran portfolio in uh, the last uh, part of the Trump administration. Four years later, 
Uh, Iran is closer than ever to nuclear weapons capability, and its regional aggression has set fire, as we've been discussing, on multiple fronts, attacking and threatening not only Israel, but also commercial traffic, as well as naval vessels um, off the coast of Yemen. What's your expectation of the second Trump administration's approach to Iran, and what are we to make of the reported meeting between Elon Musk, now a key advisor to the president-elect, and the Iranian ambassador to the UN, which I see that the Iranians have now denied. Denies, which, which tells you nothing. But <laughs> All uh, right. first, let me just say on that meeting, I think it's a terrible idea. Um, uh, if you think that Elon Musk knows a lot about Iran and took the time to find out the history of the negotiations, uh, who exactly is the guy he's dealing with? Um, what role does he play? I, 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 there's no evidence he did any of that. So... I think it's a kind of freelancing, not that he didn't tell President Trump in advance, I'm sure he did, but it is a kind of freelancing that I think is not helpful. And, you know, what what did he understand fully the messages he was getting? Did they understand? I, I just think it's, a, it's undisciplined and it's a mistake. Now, what will the administration do? Go back for a minute. What was the first Trump administration policy? It wasn't just maximum pressure. It was maximum pressure to do something, to get something. Uh, President Trump wanted a uh, deal with Iran. He was very critical of the JCPOA, the Obama deal, because he thought it dealt only with nukes rather than also missiles and also Iran's support for terrorism in the region. And it was time limited. And what he wanted, what Secretary Pompeo wanted, was a much better deal, a deal that would cover all of Iran's nefarious behavior and wouldn't be limited to, you know, three years for this, five years for that. Obviously, Iran didn't want that, so you need to press very hard economically. Um, I believe he's going to do that again. I think you'll see a return to uh, maximum pressure through sanctions. I think you will see more pressure on the Houthis, um, partly because we know that um, the U.S. Navy and CENTCOM want more pressure on the Houthis, and partly because I think the military, um, Secretary Hexit maybe is going to come to him and say, every day they are attacking U.S. naval ships with Iranian missiles. And the law of averages suggests that sooner or later they're going to hit one and they're gonna kill Americans. And that'll be on your watch. So what do we do about that? I think that, you know, if I were drawing up a list for real danger in the first weeks, that's one of the pieces. Um, <clears throat> I think you'll see a tougher line on Iranian attacks on Americans in Iraq or Syria and by the Houthis um, and I think on the sanctions part as well. It's much harder now because something like 95% of Iranian oil goes to China. Um, one way of dealing with that, which I really hope the administration does, again, right off the bat, talk to the British, French, and Germans about invoking snapback, which they have the right to do until October 25, um, which would bring back all the UN sanctions. There are a number of countries that uh, actually will enforce UN sanctions, US sanctions reluctantly, UN sanctions much more willingly. So I hope we do that early. We've been uh, we've been pushing for that in AJC as well to invoke snapback. It's really about long past time to do that. Um, do you do you see a long term resolution to the Iranian threat? problem that does not have a military component? Yeah. Um, the fall of the regime. Um, it, the regime will fall. I mean, the Soviet Union fell. Uh, it's a brutal, vicious dictatorship that the people of Iran hate. Um, but we have no ability to predict when that will happen any more than we did with the Soviets. Um, but I think that is that's the right way to solve this peacefully. Um, the timescale may not work. I do hope that that in a new administration, messages are quickly passed to the Iranians that um, 
Number one, if you kill an American indirectly through one of your proxies, we're going to hit you. You, not the proxy, you. Secondly, I hope the, the president reinforces what I think is now five presidents have said, which is you're not getting a nuclear weapon while I'm president and I will do whatever it takes. Um, president Biden said this with great clarity in the so-called Jerusalem Declaration of 2022. Um, I, I think something like that should be repeated because I think uh, it will really deter the Iranians. I think they will believe it. And I think that President Trump should make it clear they're not going to get there and he will stop them from getting there. Um, I, I really think that might hold them back from trying to cross that line. And obviously we, we've seen in the last few weeks that the Israelis um, have helped hold them back by hitting one of the pieces of their nuclear weapons program. Quite remarkable. Quite remarkable. Um, I have a couple of more questions. I'm also conscious of the time, and I want to leave a little time um, at the end for uh, some people in our audience to to chime in as well. But I do have to ask you about the UN. Um, uh, long record of obsessive and one-sided focus on Israel, as you know. And the U.S. ambassador there in both Democratic and Republican administrations has typically devoted a fair amount of time and political capital to pushing back against unfair treatment of our ally. Uh, do you have a sense that we should expect anything different in the second Trump administration under Ambassador Stefanik, um, including the possibility, without an ambassador, <laughs> of disengaging from that institution that uh, that is so problematic in so many ways, but it also plays a, a key role in, in, in a number of uh, fields? I think disengagement could happen, but it would be, it would not be something that we walk into. It would be something we are backed into, for example, by the expulsion of Israel from the General Assembly. <clears throat> I think that if Israel ex is expelled, we will not participate in the General Assembly and we'll stop paying dues, <clears throat> excuse me, which I think we should do. Um, what will change? Uh, I, I think the Biden administration, like the Obama administration, really hates vetoing in the Security Council. That was not the view of, for example, the Bush administration, <clears throat> where we thought, you know, if you can veto an anti-Israel resolution, you should take the rest of the week off. You've done the best thing you're going to do that week. I think that's going to be more the Stefanik view. And that helps, again, in not only in preventing the worst resolutions, but in improving um, mediocre resolutions, because you're in a better position to negotiate. <clears throat> I'd like to see us take a harder line. And I think this is likely with Stefanik and Trump on the anti-Semitism that pervades many UN institutions. One of them obviously is the Human Rights Council in Geneva. <clears throat> One of them is UNRWA. Um, I mean, if you think about it, it should not be, it should not be that wonderful organization, Impact SE, um, that exposes the fact that UNRWA textbooks are filled with anti-Semitic hate. We should do that. We as a member of the Security Council and the General Assembly and a big paymaster for UNRWA, we are the ones who should be saying, not a dime until that's fixed. It's not so hard to fix. I mean, you look around the Middle East at uh, Egyptian textbooks, Saudi textbooks, Emirati textbooks, they're all being improved every year. But Palestinian textbooks are not. UNRWA textbooks are not. That's unforgivable. And we should not forgive it. And I think that's the kind of fight that you'll see more of. Very interesting. Uh, look, I think it, it also has to be acknowledged that there have been vetoes by the Biden administration of certain yes. uh, anti-Israel resolutions. And I think also it's important to note that there are certain UN agencies that have done really important work. And I would say that the fact that the United States is back in UNESCO, which has under the current Sec director general really done some very important things on anti-Semitism. It, it's true. And I would add that, you know, if, if you want over a period of time to replace UNRWA completely, which I think we should, yeah. um, there are really efficient UN agencies. We could just mention the High Commissioner for Refugees and the yeah. World Food Program and UNICEF. 
I mean, there are a lot of UN agencies that work in this area and, and do wonderful work. Um, final question for me. Um, it's unclear to me and to many observers how determined President-elect Trump is to partner with Ukraine in efforts to achieve victory over Russia, to beat back the invasion launched by Vladimir Putin um, almost three years ago. Republicans on Capitol Hill appear split on this issue. How do you see this playing out? I'm not really worried about it. <clears throat> I'm not, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm not worried about Trump policy personally in Asia with respect to China, nor in the Middle East above all. Uh, I'm worried about Ukraine because there've been a lot of statements by a lot of uh, people in the, let's say the Trump camp. Um, and um, very few of them have been positive uh, and, and have suggested um, that we're gonna help Ukraine. <clears throat> My hope is that, you know, once officials get in place, they begin to argue to the president then after January 20th, <clears throat> you, um, you don't wanna look like a loser to Putin. Um, and he's perfectly capable of crowing. You don't want another Kabul, Afghanistan debacle where things collapse in Ukraine and everybody blames you. We need to be very careful and deliberate in what we do. Uh, that's my hope, but um, I'm that's the one that really worries me. Okay, on that less on that more sober note, uh, let's open it up to to questions. Daniel, thank you, Jason. Yes, we have many questions. We'll see how many we can get to. Uh, this from Jerry Schiff. Uh, do you foresee a second Trump administration shifting U.S. foreign policy focus to new regions or conflicts, and how might that reallocation of attention affect? America's current commitments in places like the Middle East and Eastern Europe? The only one that I can see that would be of that gravity uh, is Asia. That would be if the Chinese move against um, Taiwan or move against another ally, let's say Philippines, in a really um, <clears throat> unacceptable way. And that would change the world, of course, because it would mean the Chinese had chosen confrontation with the United States. Other than that, uh, I don't I don't see one arising. I mean, one can theorize. What if Putin decides to go against a NATO country or even another European country that is not part of NATO? Um, I'm not so sure. I'm optimistic about that because I think the condition of the Russian military is so bad at this point, so um, hurt uh, in terms of weaponry and in terms of manpower that that is not likely. The the China Taiwan thing I think is the great worry. So thank thank you Be, because you mentioned NATO. I'll go to Jerry Kustoff's question. How do you see how do you see a second Trump administration engaging with NATO and other traditional alliances, particularly given ongoing tensions in Europe and the need for unified responses to Russian aggression? Well, it, it's a concern. Um, <clears throat> The Trump policy on NATO in, in his first term worked in the sense that, um, you know, as, as the Secretary General of NATO then said, uh, there had never been more action in countries moving to 2% of GDP um, than when Trump made those threats. It's, it is a different NATO in the sense that it has Sweden and Finland now, makes it a, uh, a stronger NATO. Those are really capable countries from military point of view. And there's another change I would point out. Um, there's no real European leadership. I mean, if you think about it, people who were viewed as leaders, you can criticize them or not criticize them, but someone like Angela Merkel, who was around during his first term, was thought of as the leader of Europe. There is no such person today, not in Germany or France or England or really anywhere else. Um, I'm not sure if that makes it more difficult or less difficult uh, when it comes to engaging with NATO, I do expect continued pressure, uh, and and I support it. Continued pressure on countries that are not doing their fair share. It's actually correct that um, we should be we should be doing uh, what we have been doing in full support of NATO, but so should they. Um, and I think the browbeating that they got in term one will continue, and rightly so. 
Thank you, Daniel. Our next question from Russell Schwartz and a few, a few other people actually have been asking about the possibility that Netanyahu's coalition or a, a group makes a push to annex West Bank either formally or functionally. Is this something that a new Trump administration might support? Well, you know, <clears throat> Mike Huckabee has sort of supported it in the past, though he's he's a private citizen still. Um, is it conceivable? Uh, it's conceivable. Uh, on the Israeli side, is it conceivable that coalition politics would lead Netanyahu in that direction? Yeah, it's conceivable. Um, I think it's unlikely. First, uh, I think it's unlikely in Israeli politics um, because Netanyahu's coalition might begin to fray. There are people in Likud who don't want to do that. Um, and I think the president, that is Trump, I think is very concerned about uh, relations with the Gulf Arab states and about the Abraham Accord idea. Um, and is likely, I think, to warn the Israelis, you're going to kill it. Just as annexation would have killed the deal with the Emirates, you're going to close the door for a deal with the Saudis for years to come. So it is conceivable to me, but I don't think it's going to happen. Thank you. Our next... let me, can, oh, go ahead, Jason. Dan, Dan, let me just jump in. There's... A, there's... I mean, there are a lot of countries we haven't talked about and a lot of region, regional issues that, uh, that that we could spend hours talking about. Uh, but I want to ask you about actually the most populous country in the world, um, a friend of the United States, but one that insists on strategic autonomy, um, India. What do you see with the very close relationship that obviously exists between President Trump and Prime Minister Modi, that at least we saw in the first Trump administration. How do you see that relationship playing out? And do you see something that is more like an alliance or does that seem a little too far, a little too um, distant to a goal? I got back from New Delhi on Sunday. Um, so it's it's Perfect. much in my mind. Good timing. Uh, I think the relationship will, will continue to warm um, under, uh, it, it has, uh, really since George W. Bush in 2005, when we made, we since accepted them as a nuclear power. That's 20 years of presidents of both parties. Uh, I think that trend will continue. Um, it has a military component. It's not gonna be a military alliance of the sort we have with Australia uh, or Japan or South Korea, but uh, there will be more and more military cooperation. There already is, for example, between India and Australia between India and Japan. And there will be more directly with the United States too. I think this is a critical relationship for Israel. And my advice to Israelis whom I meet with has been, just pay more attention to this. We have seen the, the Indians move from uh, an automatic support in the UN of anti-Israel resolutions to an almost automatic abstention. Um, they are very interested in Israel. You know, their sense of what is Hinduism? Well, it's a religion, but it's also a people very analogous to what Israel and Jews are dealing with. Um, they understand Israel as a high tech power that they want to have something to do with. They view this area, by the way, you don't hear the term Middle East as much as Western Asia. You have East Asia, China, Japan, you have India, and then there's West Asia. I think that given that it is the world's most populous country, it's growing fast, its military is growing fast, um, it's a critical potential ally, let's say, um, for Israel, to which they should pay a lot of attention, as, as should we. It's a democracy. It's a great thing, particularly with China there, that the world's most populous country is a democracy. Uh, as as you may may know, HSC has paid a lot of attention to India, and and we 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 feel exactly the same way. What you have expressed, and the relationship between India and Israel, is so exciting to, to see the trajectory that it has pursued and uh, followed, rather, and 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 to know what what lies ahead. Which is, you're right, um, really the sky's the limit. Daniel, maybe there's time for another one or two questions. Sure, I'll give two final questions here. Uh, the first from Susan Henning. 
the Trump administration made historic progress with the Abraham Accords, of course, which Jason, you mentioned at the top. What are the prospects for expanding these agreements under a second Trump term in which countries might be next in line to normalize relations with Israel? And then a final question from Vicky Bledsoe of the role that you anticipate human rights and democracy promotion would play in foreign policy of a Trump administration, especially in countries that you're, of course, very familiar with in Venezuela, Iran, Russia. Uh, I don't think it's going to, uh, let me take the last word. I don't think democracy and human rights per se are going to play a large role um, for the president. Senator Rubio has been more interested in those matters, um, and particularly in the case of Venezuela, because again, he's been senator from Florida. It's a very large Venezuelan um, a citizen population and migrant population. But if you think about a place like um, Egypt, will the Trump administration be heavily critical of President Sisi for his many, many human rights violations? I really doubt it. Um, he, President Trump just has not had uh, a great interest in that. On the uh, Abraham Accords, um, the critical question, as we said before, is going to be, what is the real Saudi view in the real world in 2025 on Palestinian statehood? They've made a lot of categorical statements. What can they accept and how far can the Israelis go? If you could get the Saudis into a normalization process, um, you know, the country that everybody talks about is Indonesia. Um, and that would be great because it is the most populous Muslim country in the world. Um, you know, if you look at domestic politics in Indonesia, it's I think it's challenging to see how um, their new president uh, does this. Um, though you can do it in, you know, salami tactics. That is, you don't jump the way the, uh, let's say, the Emiratis did to full normalization with with embassies um, or the way they you know, exist with Morocco, um, you do a visit, um, you know, you, you then you have, a, after that you have a trade off. I mean, there are things that we know how this is done because we've seen Arab countries do it over time. That would be the, um, I, I think is more realistic than, than Malaysia, Pakistan is I think unrealistic. So if the Saudi uh, agreement is possible, then the country that I would think should be the target is Indonesia. I think, um, Elliot, we've downloaded as much from your brain and your experience as we possibly could in the course of one hour, and we're really grateful for that. Um, this has been typically, characteristically, expect, as we expected, enlightening, and thank you for your time today, and as always, your friendship and your, 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 your guidance to AJC. Daniel? It's my pleasure. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Elliot. And thank you, Jason, for today's AJC Advocacy Anywhere program. And thank you to our global audience for tuning in. To stay up to date on the latest news and analysis, please visit us at AJC.org and follow us at AJC Global on X, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.